Chapter 1031 Phoenix God Mountain The reason they were to meet in the virtual community was because Qin Yuan Hao had a contract with a spirit. He escaped from the shelter where he was held, so returning to the sanctuary might have resulted in a painful death. When Hansen went there to meet with him, he saw Lin Weiwei, Lin He, Chen Hu, and Zhao Xian standing next to a tall young man. Lin Weiwei introduced this person to him, and Qin Yuan Hao proceeded to explain the concerning matters to Han Sr. Me and Brother Seven thought you may be unaware of the existence of a king spirit. When I learned you had been able to kill a super creature, though, I fear we may have worried too much. Qin Yuan Hao sighed. No, this is important information. I'm glad to have learned this, and while we knew about super creatures and king spirits, we did not know there was a king spirit in the vicinity. If you hadn't risked life and limb to inform us, we might have been caught with our pants down, Hansen said with appreciation. Qin Juenhao then said, You are welcome. If you have some place to run, it is best to move now. Else, stay here and never return to the sanctuary. Hansen asked, Brother Qin, aside from Holy Sword Emperor, are there any other king spirits or super creatures we do well to know about in the region? Qin Juenhao swiftly answered, There aren't any more king spirits. But super creatures? Yes, there are two of them. One belongs to Holy Sword Emperor through a mutual respect, earned by him having saved the super creature's life one time. The other super creature is there by contract. When Hansen heard that there were two super creatures, he looked dismayed. If Holy Sword Emperor was on a journey to some remote desert, he might have had an easier time obtaining its spirit stone. But with news that there were two super creatures still there, guarding the shelter, he doubted he could pull it off. Furthermore, if there were super creatures, the rest of the shelter had to be packed with sacred blood and royal spirits. Hansen could not kill them all at his current level. He could enable his super king spirit mode, but he'd have one hour to complete the entire conquest. Even if he risked running inside for the sole purpose of obtaining the spirit stone, if it had been hidden, he wouldn't have enough time to eliminate the enemies there and then commit to a search. His body would be practically crippled afterwards, too. Brother Chin, can you tell me about the Phoenix Desert and God Mountain? Hansen fancied the idea of slaying the king's spirit, but he had to collect as much intel as he could. Yes, I can tell you what I know. Following this, Chin Juan Hao told Hansen everything he knew. Phoenix Desert was a dominion of creatures now, but 100,000 years ago, an emperor spirit ruled the area. This spirit's title was Phoenix, and he was the most powerful spirit to have ever existed in the third god sanctuary. But then he went to the fourth god sanctuary, leaving nowhere behind. Over time, Phoenix's shelter became known as God Mountain. Many warriors traversed those blistering deserts, all in search of God Mountain and the treasure it contained. But nothing ever came of such searches. In fact, most never even found the fabled location known as God Mountain. Holy Sword's shelter was fairly close to Phoenix Desert, but try as he might, not even Holy Sword Emperor had been able to locate God Mountain. When Brother Seven entered the Third God Sanctuary, he spawned in Holy Sword Shelter. Holy Sword Emperor had just lost a fight, and in his foul mood, he planned on killing Brother Seven in a vain attempt to make himself feel better. But Brother Seven managed to prove to the spirit that he would be useful. After being spared, he worked tirelessly in his service. Eventually, he helped Holy Sword Emperor discover the exact location where God Mountain could be found. Brother Seven was good. He did something a king spirit could not, Chen Hu said. Everyone shared this thought. Qin Juan Hao said, he's not a great fighter. The fortitude of his mind is his greatest asset. He is intelligent. He is a geographical professor who just so happens to be well-versed in the arts of feng shui. While he proved to be of some worth, he was still hesitant about wanting to assist a king spirit. So, even though he helped him locate God Mountain, he made sure it would take a long time. Brother Seven is a good man, Hansen said, admiring him. But still, it was all in vain, Qin Yuan Hao continued to say. Holy Sword Emperor found a Geno item. This item allowed him to find the entrance of God Mountain. He has taken Brother Seven with him, but Brother Seven said he would do his best to stop the spirit from obtaining a certain treasure, no matter what it took. Qin Yuan Hao sighed and spoke with remorse, saying, Brother Seven is such an honorable man. He shouldn't be forced to die this way. I'm still only breathing because of him. I'd have died years ago if it weren't for him. He's the one that bid me to come here and inform you of all this, too. 
You said he left a map that would show where the mountain is? Hansen asked. Yes, Chin Jiwen Hao answered. May I have a copy? Hansen asked. Of course. What do you plan to do with it, though? Chin Jiwen Hao wondered. I want to go to Phoenix God Mountain. Maybe there is something I can do to help Brother Seven, Hansen said, squinting. Chin Jiwen Hao looked as if he was in shock, and he said, No, you can't. That place is too dangerous, and Holy Sword Emperor is most mighty and strong. And with Brother Seven's contract, there is no possible way you could save him. If there's a will, there's a way. Hansen did not explain too much about what he was thinking of doing. More than anything, right now, he simply wanted that map. Chapter 1032 There is Treasure Hansen reached the desert, map in hand. It was very detailed, and there were many points of interest marked on it. Locating his exact position was not at all difficult. Due to the Silver Fox's continued absence, Hansen traveled there with just Bauer. Holy Sword Emperor had not come alone, though, according to what he was told. Still, provided no super creatures were accompanying him, Hansen thought he'd do just fine. What Hansen most feared was the mountain he was headed towards. It had once belonged to an emperor's spirit, after all. He had no idea what to expect or what he might find once he reached it. Carrying a parasol to deflect the brutal heat of that region, Hansen traveled. Bauer, who was in his other arm, had her tongue out like a puppy. It didn't seem as if she was too fond of the weather, either. But suddenly, Hansen stumbled across a dune that was littered with the remains of dead scorpions. They were muddy in color and fairly big. Each was about the same size as a small car. There had to be at least 300 of them all strewn about. Judging from the wounds they had incurred, each had been killed in a single hit. Hansen checked his map again, and it was noted that there would be a vast number of scorpions in a location that looked to be where he was at right now. He was on the right track. It looks like Holy Sword Emperor passed through this way. Hansen checked the wounds again, to see if he could estimate when exactly they had died. From what he could tell, they had been slain no later than one day before. He was close. They were sacred blood creatures, but Hansen didn't bring any with him. They were inedible, according to Brother Seven. This didn't just apply to the scorpions, either. Curiously, almost every monster that populated that desert had the strange property of being inedible. Their drop rate for beast souls was awful, too. As such, he couldn't expect to receive any on his venture there. Of course, that was what he had been told and what had been written on the map. Trying to have a nibble himself was the only way he could confirm whether or not it was true. Brother Seven said, after killing a thousand monsters there, he had only been able to obtain one beast soul. With the bodies there, at least, Hansen knew he was headed in the right direction. After four days of travel, Hansen found himself almost walking in circles. One would have assumed Brother Seven's abilities of cartography were very poor at first glance, but it really was a strange route he had to take. But after seeing those bodies, Hansen was confident he would ultimately be led to God Mountain if he stayed on the funny route the map said he had to follow. And he wasn't wrong. Before long, a mountain came into view, its peak nestled above misty clouds. It stood out and was a striking sight. But it had just snapped into his vision in an instant, fairly close. He should have been able to see such a mountain from a long distance away. As if it had appeared out of thin air, a massive edifice of stone was now ahead. He took a moment to take in its splendor, but wondered what was at the very top, at the peak that was hidden from sight. The mountain was massive, though. It was difficult to comprehend its size, and it had to be many hundreds of miles in length. It was decorated in a vast array of green plants, but the earth that composed it was like sparkling copper that gleamed in the midday sun. The phoenix shelter had sealed up and had indeed become a mountain like in the legends. Not even other emperor spirits would be careless when approaching such a place. But the task that stood before him now was locating its entrance, and for such a big place, that wouldn't be easy. Hansen used his Dongshin aura to scan the nearby vicinity. He couldn't see any human or spirit ahead of him. The map ended here, though. This was most likely because Brother Seven himself had never gone any further. Regardless, Hansen hopped to it. He had to find the entrance of that place as soon as he could. Not daring to fly, Hansen simply walked. The mountain wasn't too steep, but the slopes were still wide. After a whole day of traveling, he was still on what could be considered the foothills. The plants he had seen were all around. They were lovely there, and it was pleasant to know there weren't any nefarious beings lurking beneath their canopies. In fact, 
there were no creatures at all. Hansen grew concerned, though, unsure of how long it would take for him to circle the mountain, if that was what it was going to take to locate the entrance. Maybe I should head straight for the peak first? Hansen decided to venture straight up instead. It took him a whole day of careful travel to get there. Or so he initially thought, after reaching what he believed to be the peak, he saw an even higher one up ahead. He continued his climb up this new mountaintop, but when he arrived at the top, it was to the realization that there'd be another peak to climb. The mountain seemed endless. Hansen decided to look down the way he had come. Even the clouds seemed far off now. This peak isn't leading to a sky palace, is it? He wondered, despite knowing shelters did not have sky palaces. All of a sudden, Bauer leapt out of Hansen's arms. She kept on running in a direction, beelining there with sudden vigor. Bauer, where are you going? Hansen called, chasing the runaway baby. Something had clearly snared her attention and desire, and she crawled away so fast, she eventually disappeared from Hansen's sight. Taking a moment to scan the area, Hansen found her again. She was climbing a tree. Strangely, it was just a pine tree. But from its boughs, Bauer jumped and disappeared again. Bauer? There was only one pine tree there, so how could she have just disappeared? Daddy, come quick. There is treasure. Hansen heard her voice, but he could not see where she herself was. So, he followed where the sound came from. Chapter 1033, Taking the Treasure Hansen climbed the pine tree, but still couldn't see Bauer. Bauer? Where are you? Hansen shouted. Here. Bauer's head popped out from behind a metaphysical wall the tree brushed up against. Seeing just her head, looking at him from outside what appeared to be a stone wall, he was perplexed, to say the least. He reached over with his arm and tried to touch the same wall Bauer's head was sticking out from, and much to his surprise, it went right through. It was an illusion. The wall looked rock solid, but that was only an appearance. There was nothing physical there, at all. Daddy, come, Bauer said. Hansen pulled his whole body through, and when he looked up, he noticed he was in a large cave. Looking back, he could see the pine tree he had climbed, and the rest of the environment. It was like a one-way mirror of sorts. The cave didn't seem like anything special, though. So, what might have been hidden there was not immediately apparent. There were plenty of stalactites, but that was it, in terms of decoration. Bawa sat upon a rock, gnawing on purple mushrooms. Hansen saw there were many other such mushrooms near the rock she sat on, and he thought they looked delicious. But he knew the more colorful a mushroom was, the more poisonous it could be. Back in the world of the Alliance, he wouldn't have dared to eat one. Seeing Bauer happily munching away, though, he knew they couldn't have all been bad. So, he decided to try one. He picked one up and sunk his teeth into its moist cap. Then, he ate it all. He immediately felt really cool as a chill ran up and down his body. Sacred Geno Point plus one. That came as quite the surprise. He was more than happy, discovering the mushrooms there could provide him sacred blood Geno points. He and Bauer then stayed there for a while, merrily chomping on as many mushrooms as they could. Over and over, the announcements popped for Hans Sr. But after downing the fifth mushroom, the announcement stopped. He couldn't receive any more sacred Geno points off them. Bauer continued to eat as many as she could, though. After a while, she sat back and burped. She was done, too. Hansen decided to poke about the cave some more. It seemed rather deep, and there could be plenty of spelunking to do before he was done exploring it all. Might I be able to enter the shelter from here? Hansen wondered to himself. If the entrance was as well hidden as this cave was, he imagined he would never find a way in. He'd probably have to inspect every inch of the mountain to find another not-a-wall wall that may have existed, just like the one that had led him there. Such a task would take years. The idea of continuing to explore this cave, though, concerned Hans Senator it felt as if he could no longer make use of Da Shinora. He tried using it and felt its radius shrink down to one meter. Then, nothing. He couldn't use it at all anymore. That must have been why he could not sense the boons the mushrooms would have provided, and only decided to eat them upon seeing Bauer enjoy them. Bauer, come on. We should go deeper, Hansen said, and so off they went. The cave was fairly straight, without any branching pathways. The duo walked for hours, and still, there was no end in sight. The only remarkable thing to occur on that long travel was stumbling across another variety of mushrooms. Bauer was full, though, so she was not interested in eating them. Hansen ate one, but found out they did nothing. There was no point increase. 
So, he summoned Meowth and Golden Growler and got them to eat the mushrooms. He had continued feeding them water drops for quite some time, but it had been a while since the drops had influenced their growth. No longer did the water drops make them stronger. After some more travel, Hansen saw a light at the end of the tunnel. He was excited to see what might be ahead, but he doubted he'd find the entrance to Phoenix Shelter through that dingy cavern. When he exited the cave, he was back outside. Strangely, though, there were no more peaks to climb. He had emerged on the absolute mountaintop. When he looked down, the mountains looked like large lotus flowers. Every petal was one of the peaks. It was no wonder it had taken him a long time to reach the highest point. Upon this main peak, there was a big tree. It had to be at least a hundred meters tall, but it was dead, dried up like charcoal. It was, however, hollow. Also of note, the tree appeared to have been chopped in half. It must have been cut by some fearsome weapon. I wonder what sort of weapon would be able to cut through this tree? Hansen asked himself, as he examined the tree. After noticing the tree was hollow, Hansen decided to check it out. The space inside was about as wide as a basketball court. Looking inside, Hansen noticed a golden feather inside the trunk. It was there in plain sight. The two-meter-long feather was shining gold, much like starlight. It was hot, too, even for Hansen who was exceptionally talented when it came to dealing with fire. It felt like metal when Hansen touched it, and he tried lifting the feather by its hard tip. Unfortunately, despite using all his strength, he could not move it. It was frighteningly heavy. Chapter 1034 The Phoenix Descends and the Emperor Dies Hansen was shocked. He was a strong man, and he could lift even the heaviest of items. This feather, though, would require a heft far beyond his capabilities. You dot day to be dot why novelful, calm. It was heavier than any metal he had ever known. But not wanting to give up, Hansen flexed and prepared to give it another go. Is this metal? Or is it the actual feather of some bird? Hmm. But if it did belong to a bird, how could such a creature possibly fly with a wing full of them? As he thought, Hansen tried dragging it from left to right. The feather was almost like a hiltless sword. It made for a supremely sharp blade. Hansen brought out a Z-steel stone and ran it against the feather. With remarkable ease, the Z-steel stone was split in two as if it were made of butter. Even with Taya, he had to use much strength to cut through things. When Taya was in Hansen's hands, it could be used to slay super creatures in the third god's sanctuary. If Taya had been wielded by a mere evolver, its use would mean a struggle to kill a measly creature of even the first god's sanctuary. But without much effort, weight, or force, the feather effortlessly cut the Z-steel stone in two. It was like magic. Perhaps its weight correlated to its strength, and that was why? Either way, it was remarkable. Looking at the edge of the feather, Hansen had a sickly feeling. It looked so thin. Giving the feather another wiggle, he did so with greater care. It was almost frightening how sharp the feather was. It felt as if it had the power to tear through the fabric of space and time. This is quite the price. Since I found this thing up here, on Phoenix Mountain, I will call it the Phoenix Sword. Hansen had never been proficient when it came to naming things. Hansen brought out his Taya sword. Their lengths were different, but they would make a fine duo. With them, he could practice double fly. I need to practice double fly. If I don't, it would be a waste of two good swords, Hansen told himself. If he left the area now, with Phoenix sword, he'd have been satisfied. He didn't even care much for finding a way into the shelter, anymore. But he had initially ventured to this place in the hopes of rescuing Brother Seven from a callous spirit. Hansen left the tree with a renewed vigor for finding an entrance into Phoenix shelter. All of a sudden, though, he was hit with a strange sensation. It felt as if the mountain had been missing something. God Mountain's peaks were like petals, but from where he now stood, he could see that there was something amiss. He only noticed what was missing because he was at the highest point. Hansen did not know much about Feng Shui, so if he had been farther down, he never would have noticed it. Hansen packaged the Phoenix Sword, picked up Bauer, and went towards a parcel of the mountain that lacked the distinct features to have it fit in with the Lotus Petal Kalash. It was situated at around the halfway point of the mountain. Not needing to fly, he just slid his way down. He came to a stop on a stone platform, and he turned to look at a copper wall that skirted the back of it. It had been dressed in a variety of vines, ones which Hansen promptly removed, in the hopes the copper wall would be another metaphysical doorframe. Unfortunately, after pressing against the copper in every way he could, nothing was revealed. It was solid. He was stubborn, though. 
and he kept on feeling the copper wall, determined to find something. Eventually, his hands ran across a strange indent. It was like a little slot, and around as thin as Bowis' arm. He brushed away more of the vines to reveal it as a written character. Removing more of these vines exposed a number of different words that were written in a language Hansen was unfamiliar with. Hansen summoned Thorn Baron to ask her if it was a language of the spirits. Her answer was, yes, these are spirits' words. What do they say? Hansen asked. Thorn Baron had a curious, almost perplexed look on her face, and she said, the phoenix descended on God Mountain and the emperor died. Hansen didn't really understand, and so he asked Thorn Baron if she understood. She told him, well, I can read it, but even I am not sure what it all means. Does it say anything else? There was very little to go on, so we thought there had to be more. Thorn Baron frowned and just said, the words are strange. They don't have meaning. Thorn Baron continued reading the inscribed words, but they made little sense. There was no cohesion or form to what was written. It was all mumbo jumbo. Thorn Baron then said, I know what each word means but it's all jumbled up like nonsense. There is no meaning to what comes past the first line. As they discussed this, the platform trembled as if an earthquake had just begun. Chapter 1035, The Pilgrimage of a Thousand Birds The platform lowered. It descended slowly until it came to a stop before a stone door. Is this the entrance to Phoenix Shelter? Hansen was delighted, thinking he might have found it. He looked at the many vines that draped the doorframe. They looked undisturbed, which told him Holy Sword Emperor had not yet arrived. Or, if he had, the spirit had not come this way. Hansen summoned Sword Furnace Spirit. Treachery and danger might have lurked ahead, so we thought the spirit could make a fine decoy. At Hansen's command, Sword Furnace pushed the door open. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred, it just opened like any average door might. Beyond the door rested a stone staircase that descended a very long way down. Eventually, the stairs took a turn. What lurked at the bottom, Hansen could not yet tell. Along with Bauer, Hansen stepped inside. Sword Furnace led the way, and after some time venturing down, they arrived before a palace. Surprisingly, there had been no danger, and nothing inherently peculiar stood out to them. Even the door of the palace seemed normal. The door was ajar, and from what he could see from where he stood, there were many copper items inside. There was a furnace, a ding, and a number of statues, all wrought from copper. Going inside, he noticed statues on either side of the entrance hall. They all depicted birds. There was a peacock, a crane, a sparrow, and even one of bees. The walls had mosaics and plaques, with themes and designs all revolving around birds. Across the ceiling, there was a painting of a grand purple peacock. Across the tiled floor, there were many illustrations of cranes. It was like a museum, dedicated to birds and birds alone. An image of a bird adorned everywhere that Hansen looked, and even the pillars of the hall were decorated with pictures or carvings of them. Hansen wandered around the palace for some time, but strangely, he did not come across a single image of a phoenix. Is it because Phoenix Emperor resembled the phoenix, anyway? Hansen guessed. Aside from the statues and the other bird-based decorations, there did not seem to be anything of value. The only thing of note was the throne. Phoenix Emperor must have sat right there. But why do only paintings and statues remain here? Thinking of this, Hansen then told Sword Furnace to examine the throne more closely. The throne was engraved with a number of bird illustrations, just like everything else in the palace. After Sword Furnace had finished investigating the seat, Hansen decided to sit on it. After Hansen sat down on the throne, it suddenly seemed as if the statues before him were alive. It seemed as if they were there, ready to obey him. This Phoenix Emperor dude had taste, Hansen thought. It was strange to imagine Phoenix Emperor spending so much time and effort to merely be able to sit there and enjoy the artwork and the feelings they elicited. It was a unique sensation, but it was only achievable by sitting down on the throne. With Phoenix Emperor's power, he could have most certainly gathered a flock of genuine birds. It was weird to see such focus and time given to the creation of fake ones. Hansen continued sitting on that throne observing the birds in a new light. Eventually, though, his face turned dim. Following a tingling sensation, the birds did indeed start to look more and more alive. Eventually, he was stricken with the feeling that the birds were about to fly towards him. Everything seemed so real. They may have actually been statues, but they were shaped, sculpted, 
and build in a way that was as convincing as a real bird. And what's more, no bird looked alike. They each had a personality, despite being constructed objects. Many might have appeared rather similar, but there were minor variations to make even those stand out from their inanimate peers. Was this his study room? Maybe. Hansen felt as if he had learned something through this idle observation. Hansen had once learned Heavenly Go and Seven Twist, which he later combined into Arrow. This technique was associated with birds. After watching the birds for a while longer, he felt as if they were somehow related to the self-taught arrow talent. By simply watching the birds before him, he felt as if he was given a greater understanding of arrow. He was learning a lot about birds, all by simply watching them. He realized there were many things about birds he had never seen or even considered before, and it was like his mind had breached a veil, and he'd now be operating on a higher plane of existence. He was in a different world now. I didn't know I could do that, Hansen thought, considering the new options that were opening before him. Hansen then focused his attention and examined every bird individually. They weren't alive, but every time he looked back to a bird he had previously looked at, it would seem different. Hansen stood up to take a better look. Before Hansen sat on the throne, he hadn't noticed anything peculiar about the hall. After sitting on the throne and standing up again, his perception of everything had changed. It was like a 3D picture. At first, the image of the hall was plain and meaningless. But now, looking closely, it was as if a lock had been broken. He could see things differently from a multitude of different angles. The hall, of course, had been designed better than any 3D image ever could. Its depth was unparalleled, and you'd discover and learn a number of new things, depending on where you stood. Everyone had a different personality, and everyone saw things differently. The birds were this way, as well. They all looked unique, and when he looked at them from different angles, he felt differently about them. Hansen did not know how others felt, but he felt as if he had just entered a treasury. It was a treasury of knowledge, and what he had learned about Arrow there was different than anything he could ever learn from reading a book. Chapter 1036, Alu Alu. Somehow, Hansen's arrow activated. He felt incredibly light, as if he could shoot off into the skies at any given moment. As Hansen continued his observation of the birds, he suddenly heard a rumble. He turned around and saw a wall on the left side of the hall rise up. Inside, there was a room. A three-meter-tall spirit was standing inside, and just a mere glance was all it took to recognize how monstrously powerful he was. He possessed three eyes, all of which gleamed silver like the spirit's hair. They looked alive and dripped with excitement. A hundred thousand years. I, Xie Qing, am free once more. He wasted no time, calling out at the top of his lungs. He was oozing a fever-like excitement. Hansen watched the spirit with great surprise. When he arrived there, his Dongshin aura had been unavailable. As such, he had been unable to detect the presence of the spirit. If the spirit had been trapped there for such a long period of time, there must have been something special about him. Hansen wasn't afraid, though. And he wouldn't be, even if the spirit was a king spirit. He could always use his super king spirit mode, after all. What are you looking at? Get over here and bow before me. The spirit, who proclaimed himself to be Xie Qing, commanded. Are you talking to me? Hansen asked, in shock. He had mistaken Hansen, a human, for a spirit. That was quite the error of judgment, not something likely to be done by a king spirit. Hansen believed, if he had indeed been trapped down there for a hundred thousand years, the spirit would still believe humans to be primitive wildlings. Perhaps such a mistake was warranted, and maybe he didn't even know anything about humanity occupying the shelters at all yet. Are you a creature? Xie Qing frowned. Perhaps he had been trapped in there too long. No. I'm a spirit. I'm just special. Hansen held his fist as he talked, and he continued, I am San Mu, my king. You are just a royal spirit, aren't you? What is so special about you, exactly? Xie Qing eyed Hansen with suspicion. Still, there was a glimmer of a certain satisfaction, having heard Hansen refer to him as a king. Did you open my cell and free me? Xie Qing King asked Han Senior. I was simply walking around here, admiring the place. The wall opened up of its own volition, Hansen explained. Xie Qing King looked at the room and said, That cheap turkey. He used me to clear the invaders of this place. He played me like a de-asterisk MN fiddle and I waltzed right into his trap. Xie Qing King said, as he looked at Han Sr., you said your name is San Mu? Follow me. 
When I claim the treasure left behind by that turkey, I'll give you a small portion as a reward. Thanks. Hansen bowed. Hansen preferred peace. There was no need for him to create any more enemies if he could avoid it. Plus, the king's spirit had not shown an ounce of hostility. Therefore, there didn't seem to be any particular need to kill him. Is that a baby? Xie Qing King asked as he looked at Bauer. Yes, it is my daughter. Her name is Bauer, Hansen said. Xie Qing King responded, You are so weak. Why would you even waste time having a baby? Hansen thought it obnoxious. Powerful people always felt like only they should have babies. Xie Qing King observed the hall as they went, seemingly lost in thought. Xie Qing King walked across the hall to its other side and said, This way. It's high time we checked out the turkey's treasury. Hansen guessed the turkey he was referring to as Phoenix Emperor. Believing that the spirit indeed knew the way there, he saw no problem following him. But in the next second, Xie Qing King's fist blazed with a silver light. Then, he broke a wall that had been decorated with a number of avian symbols. Alu alu alu! Xie Qing King shouted as he continued to punch the wall. He punched through a meter thick wall of solid stone. Hansen was shocked at what the spirit had just suddenly managed to do. Earlier, he had tested it himself with his new phoenix sword. With a strike, he could only plunge it a single inch into the wall. Furthermore, Hansen had been afraid of traps, so he had spent most of his time in the shelter with much care. This spirit seemed to be a little on the reckless side. What are you doing over there? Come here and stay close. Xia Qing King frowned, and then he went on to mumble, I can't believe I brought a dumb asterisk SS with me. Hansen did not pay much heed to the insult he had been given, and he just followed as the spirit wanted him to. After exiting the hall, they came to a branching corridor. Hansen wondered which way the spirit might decide to go, but again, he just started to chant, Alu Alu. Then he smashed the wall ahead of them with his fist. In this way, they went on for some time. Hansen stayed close behind, as Xie Qing King broke down wall after wall. He imagined the spirit would eventually get tired of doing that, but he never seemed to. He just kept on going, wall after wall. He's pretty cool, Hansen said to himself. Chapter 1037 Petrified Xie Qing King must have broken down a dozen walls, each one a shortcut through what had to be some manner of mace. There were countless branching pathways, each guided by thick walls that were around one meter tall. It was in this wall-breaking way that they proceeded. Alu Alu Another wall was smashed through. Beyond it, something new greeted their eyes. It was another palace, just smaller in size than the previous one. It did, however, have a pool at its center and a tree in the middle of that. The tree was strange. It was two meters tall and it only had two leaves to its name. Between the leaves was a sole gray fruit. It was hefty looking, around the same size as a football, but it looked slimy and sickly. Holy Jade Fruit Xie Qing King looked at the fruit with much excitement. He reached out and tried to grab it. But before he could, the fruit broke. From within its sticky interior, a juice oozed out. Xie Qing King's face suddenly became ghastly, and so he punched the fruit away. The ooze of the fruit splashed across the tiled copper floor, and after a moment's rest, started to violently corrode the copper surface. Hansen was well aware how solid that copper was, so it was frightening to see the potency of that juice. If it touched a human, Hansen couldn't imagine the pain that would befall its victim. Xie Qing King's hand suffered a couple drops of that corrosive liquid, and it had damaged his hand a good deal. It gushed blood. The juice was no joke if it had also managed to pierce and ravage his hand while it was still ablaze with the powerful silver light. All Hansen could think was how thankful he was to have decided to hang several meters behind Xie Qing King. If he was any closer, he could very well have been sprayed by that horrendous fluid. King Corpse Juice, that D asterisk Ned Turkey. It is only fortunate I have trained in the ways of combating evil. A splash of this stuff is all it takes to fell even the most powerful spirit. After explaining, Xie Qing King punched the tree and snapped it in two. When it broke, a gray mist seeped from the two broken ends. Suddenly, he was petrified and rendered unable to move. Hansen was shocked seeing another trap immediately spring out to get Xie Chang King. Phoenix Emperor must have known what sort of person he was. Ordinary people wouldn't have punched the tree right after a spoiled harvest, but Xie Chang King did. Knowing he'd react this way, Phoenix Emperor had constructed another surprise trap for when he did. The King Corpse Juice was merely a red herring, 
and it wasn't actually the planned way to stop Xie Chain King. It was not half as efficient as a substance that could petrify. Hansen had no clue what it was, but it had worked without fault. In an instant, a king spirit was wholly petrified. As Hansen inched forward to inspect the tree, Xie Chang King started to shout. He put stone jade miasma inside the tree. Pa. Weak. He'll need to do better than that to petrify me. I'm going to dig his corpse up. Xie Ching King had managed to regain control of his eyes and mouth, but his body was still frozen stiff. What are you looking at? Are you going to help me, or what? Xie Ching King yelled. How can I help you? Hansen asked him. It was no wonder Phoenix Emperor imprisoned him down there. If he had known about him being locked up, Hansen would not have helped him out. The spirit may not have been hostile, but he was not the same species and could not 100% be trusted. Xie Ching King responded. That sneak knew I'd use my evil breaker power to smash that tree containing the stone jade miasma. I have been petrified, yes, but only my exterior has been. Break the stones that encompass me and I will be free. But I am so weak, Hansen pretended. Xie Ching King said, but you have to try. Typically, only his undying flame can break these stones, but it's worth a shot. Hansen looked at Xie Ching King and thought him to be strangely naive. He wondered why the spirit was so sure Hansen would both be willing and able to save him from his entrapment. Hansen then recalled the time he had spent in the spirit base, and how lower-tier spirits would blindly follow one who was superior and provide them spirit geno points. A real spirit would attempt to save Xie Ching King, no matter what it took. But Hansen was just a human, and he felt no obligation to save or truly follow a spirit who may have been superior to him. Hurry! The stone is starting to settle inside my flesh, strengthening. If we cooperate, perhaps the combination of our powers will be enough to break this curse, Xie Ching King pleaded. Hansen wondered whether or not he should reveal who he truly was. But just as he considered doing so, he heard a wall on the side of that chamber begin to rise. Someone is here. Hansen looked around, checking to see if there was some place he could hide. Xie Ching King noticed this, as well, and so he stopped talking. Hansen saw two men standing behind that risen wall. It was a human and a spirit, and they were both visibly surprised to see Hansen there. They had obviously entered expecting the place to be empty and free of others. Who are you? The spirit asked, staring at Hans Senator his power looked crushing, as if he could squish him like a bug. Hansen thought to himself, this must be Holy Sword Emperor. The human next to him must be Brother Seven. Chapter 1038 the view that contains a thousand birds. Who are you? Holy Sword Emperor asked. That is of no concern to you, Hansen said. Holy Sword Emperor balked and pulled out his sword. Without delay, he thrust forward, taking aim at Hansen's forehead. Hansen leapt away like a bird, evading the attack with ease. Holy Sword Emperor raised his arm and pointed with his fingers. Suddenly, they all took on a life of their own, each one becoming a free-thinking sword. The index finger was thin like a rapier, whereas the middle finger was hefty like a great sword. The thumb was like a plump dagger. The five fingers became five different swords, and swiftly, they went after Hans Sr. Holding Bauer, Hansen rode the air and dodged every finger that wished to skewer him. Despite the spirit's grand display of power, none of his attacks found their target. Holy Sword Emperor was wielding ten swords, one for each finger. Each one weaved between each other, striking with an unbelievable amount of precision and speed. Hansen did not believe any other spirit he had come across could have managed to achieve such finesse with a weapon. As Hansen danced through the air, his mind recalled the birds in the palace. As the swords launched towards him, his mind flashed back to a movement he had witnessed off one bird. He applied it to arrow and evaded whichever sword came for him, alternating through the vast array of different movements he had learned. Hansen was incredibly happy at what he was able to achieve. He had only opened eight gene locks and had 1,800 fitness, figures which made him weaker than king spirits, but that did not matter. Hansen was able to dodge every single attack that came his way from a foe that should have been out of his league. What he had learned from the birds was incredible. Of course, much of what he was doing now was all thanks to Arrow. If he didn't have it, even if he was a king spirit without it, he'd have been unable to pull off half the graceful evasions that now came to him effortlessly. Holy Sword Emperor's senses had been restricted in this place. Although it did not stifle the power he possessed, it made him unable to determine Han Sen's actual power. 
Xie Qing King, on the other hand, had a third eye that enabled him to now see more of who his follower actually was. He could most certainly tell the power Hansen held. And as he watched with great interest, Holy Sword Emperor had yet to determine whether the foe he was battling was a human or a spirit. Hansen maintained a firm grip on the baby as he pranced through the air. Continuing to evade with such grace and finesse was a remarkable feat and a display of fantastic talent. Although he may not have been able to correctly gauge who his enemy was, Holy Sword Emperor was at least aware Hansen was a powerful person. Brother Seven was not aware of who Hansen was, and he could not determine the level of power he possessed, either. The only thing he could tell was that he was a human. He knew this from the structure of his face and the clothing he wore. He had heard of humans being able to effectively do battle with royal spirits, but he had never heard of a human being able to compete with a king's spirit. The person was very young, too. It greatly surprised him how brilliant the young man was. Regardless of what was going on or what would happen later, he knew he was witnessing something quite brilliant. Plus, to top it all off, he was holding a baby. To engage in battle as he was doing, Brother Seven was in immediate adoration. Have humans really become this strong? Brother Seven wondered to himself, in awe. He knew it was only natural for humans to improve and become stronger and better able to compete with the spirits. It was an inevitability of the passage of time. But this was far beyond his wildest expectations of what was possible at their current stage in time. Whoever this person battling Holy Sword Emperor was, he was strangely powerful. Holy Sword Emperor, frustrated with his inability to determine who his foe was and how powerful he might have been, decided to up his game. He split his swords into a hundred smaller versions. The stakes had been amped up, and it actually put Hansen into some degree of danger. Even though Hansen was continuing to use arrow, it was difficult and far more trying for him to dodge his aggressor's attacks now. Three minutes later, he slipped up. A sword nicked his arm and broke the sacred blood armor there. I was almost expecting a challenge. I see the truth now. You are nothing but a wimp. You are a coward that can only flee to and fro not daring to face me like a proper opponent, Holy Sword Emperor taunted Hansen, and then fired a greater number of swords in an attempt to finish him off. Hansen knew the odds were lopsided from the get-go. The only reason he was still alive was due to Blood Pulse Sutra. But due to the buffs being unable to increase his fitness level, he hadn't been able to open more gene locks. If Hansen's Blood Pulse Sutra could go higher than 8, he'd have a power that was equivalent to 2,000 fitness. But Hansen's base fitness was still only 1,800, and because of this, he could not continue this way forever. And adding to that, the more Hansen dodged, the more the callous spirit wanted his blood. Suddenly, Hansen had an idea. He dive bombed down with haste, landing directly behind the still petrified Xie Chang King. Holy Sword Emperor had been fixated on Hansen the entire time, and had initially believed the calcified Xie Chang King to be an inanimate statue. So, he did not relent and simply decided to blast the statue with all his might. My emperor, the time is now. Hansen happily proclaimed. Boom. The statue shattered, and a man drenched in blood appeared. A silver light encompassed his body, healing his wounds. In the time that it took Xie Qing King to take two steps, he became fully healed. Good job. You were smart to save me. Xie Qing King laughed out loud, having come to really like Han Sr. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Hansen feigned happiness, but in his heart he thought, you'd still be a rock if I was able to kill Holy Sword Emperor with my Super King Spirit mode. Holy Sword Emperor looked upon Xie Qing King with remarkable shock, and he actually exclaimed, Xie Qing King. Chapter 1039 Let them fight, grab the spoils. Hansen was shocked, to say the least. He had not expected the two to have known each other. He was hoping Xie Qing King would be freed to eliminate Holy Sword Emperor but that wasn't looking likely now. You remember me? Xie Qing King asked, with a smirk. While he was petrified, he had hidden his powers. Now, he did not have to. Holy Sword Emperor forced a smile, saying, I had only just been born during the times you fought in the spirit base. You were a person I greatly admired. I cannot say I expected to see you here. Holy Sword Emperor was lying. He did not mean a word of what he said. 100,000 years ago, Holy Sword Emperor was nothing. But back then, Xie Qing King was not an emperor, just as he wasn't now. With Hansen referring to him as one, though, he was taken aback and unsure of what to say. 
Holy Sword Emperor had not known of his imprisonment here. Xie Qing King hadn't actually ascended from king to emperor status, it was just Hansen attempting to mislead Holy Sword Emperor. Xie Qing King was made glad upon hearing that Holy Sword Emperor knew his name. He did not pay much heed to Hansen, since he wasn't on the same level as him. This was different than the way he felt about Holy Sword Emperor, who was. Xie Qing King's silver eyes rested upon Holy Sword Emperor, and he asked, Have you found anything? This is where Phoenix Emperor once lived. There is treasure here, but evidently, it is well hidden. Holy Sword Emperor quickly explained. Really? Xie Qing King did not believe him. Hansen then chimed in to say, I am not sure if he has recovered anything from this place, but I have heard he was able to obtain a certain Geno item. That is how he was able to enter this place. Everyone knows because he held a big and fanciful celebration for it. When Hansen said this, Holy Sword Emperor found himself wanting to swiftly explain. But Xie Qing King cut in before him, saying, Give me that item or die. My Emperor, I... This was all Holy Sword Emperor was able to mutter before Xie Qing King swung forward with silver light. Holy Sword Emperor was not going to hand over the item he much cherished, so he decided to flee. If only running was so easy. Xie Qing King ran after him, and both spirits disappeared. Are we the same kind? Brother Seven mumbled to ask, once the spirits were gone from sight. Do you know the water pavilion? Hansen asked, out of nowhere. Qin Juan had told Hansen that. If he saw Brother Seven, he should ask this. It would confirm that he was an ally. When Brother Seven heard what was said, he happily exclaimed, Jiwen Hao made it to. Sword Furnace Shelter. Yes, he's taking a well-earned vacation in the Alliance. Hansen smiled, and then went on to ask, So, you were Brother Seven? Brother Seven nodded and said, I did not expect someone to be here, and neither did I expect that someone so young could ever possess such frightful power. If Holy Sword Emperor survives this ordeal and decides to attack your shelter with all his might, at least you can return to the Alliance safely. Hansen smiled and said, Smoke and mirrors, I'm not actually that strong. The info you provided us saved our lives. I have come here to bring you back. Holy Sword Emperor doesn't currently know what you're up to, so he can't kill you with the contract you have signed. It's best that we take this opportunity and return to the Alliance while we still can. Brother Seven shook his head though, and said, it's not worth the risk. There is treasure here, and if we are able to retrieve it, humanity as a whole will improve. It is of vital importance, and it is imperative that we claim it before they do. But you are under contract. Holy Sword Emperor can easily take it from you, Hansen said. But Brother Seven said, I know. But now that I have met you, things have changed. Are you willing to go with me to get the treasure? Treasure? Where do I sign? Hansen paused for a brief moment but then backtracked to say, but I'm serious, you should return to the Alliance. Tell me where the treasure is, and then go. You can return once I have slain Holy Sword Emperor. Brother Seven admitted with a wry smile, well, I actually don't know where it is. He went on to say, Holy Sword Emperor's treasure is a map. It leads to an item, located in the Phoenix Eye. But the location of the Phoenix Eye is ever-changing, so I have no idea where it might be. I've been known to risk much for obtaining treasure, but I'm telling you, your life is far more important than what any item can do for you. Brother Seven said, I am not concerned with myself right now. Come, we should find it. Once we claim it, you can ensure it stays out of their hands. Brother Seven then brought out a compass. He looked at it with a concentrated expression, as if he was trying to deduce something complex. After a minute of silence, he said, follow me. Brother Seven led them in the direction Hansen had come from. He passed three of the broken walls Xie Qin King had smashed through. Hansen followed him with Bao still firmly in his arms. It seemed no matter what he pleaded, Brother Seven was determined to stay. At every turn, Brother Seven consulted his compass. It meant their passage was rather slow. For hours later, they reached a dead end. A ten-meter-tall door barred their way. It was a double door, and each side was emblazoned with the painting of a phoenix. Chapter 1040, Phoenix Headlight Hansen wanted to approach the doors and examine them, but Brother Seven stopped him and said, This place is dangerous. Don't do anything reckless. Isn't that where the phoenix I might reside? Hansen asked. Brother Seven turned to look at the images of a phoenix and said, A phoenix is a bird that has died and is then reborn from the ashes of its prior form. Typically, dead is dead, and you don't get to come back from that. 
but there have been rare instances of resurrection in the past. Brother Seven noticed that the claws of each phoenix were painted around the door knockers. Each door had a knocker. When Brother Seven saw this, he said, On my signal, we knock on the door three times. Hansen nodded and moved over to the left door's knocker. The door was massive. It would have been impossible for one person to use both door knockers at the same time, so the duo had to cooperate. Brother Seven reminded Hansen to knock three times, and three times only. He looked nervous. Hansen wasn't really sure what was going on, so he wasn't feeling any sort of pressure. Brother Seven gave his command, and then they used the door knockers three times. Their knocking was perfectly in sync with each other. Back. Brother Seven shouted, which prompted them both to retreat away from the door a little. Then, they watched what might happen. Bauer was still there, suckling her milk bottle. She watched with as much curiosity as they did. The screeching of two phoenix birds sounded. The images came to life, and they left the door to fly around together. Hansen had maxed out his fire geno points, but even so, the heat the phoenixes were emitting was incredibly hot even for him. The doors slowly opened to reveal a large hall. They could see two lanterns there, still lit after all those years. Brother Seven stepped inside and said, Quick, when the phoenixes return to the doors, they will close. Hansen walked past both creatures, feeling as if his hair was being cinched. Just as they both entered the hall, the phoenixes returned to their doors, and the doors silently closed. The hall before them had nine lanterns, each shaped like the head of a phoenix. But aside from that, there was nothing else of particular interest. There was, however, another room that could enter at the back. No light came from within, so it was pitch black. Brother Seven muttered to himself, two phoenixes together, and the lanterns split them up. I didn't know spirits practiced in Yang. Brother Seven? care to speak up? What does that mean? Hansen asked. Hansen was a proficient fighter, but that was about it. He wasn't really educated in the subjects that Brother Seven was. Brother Seven then said, Phoenix Emperor is not a person. He is a spirit, Hansen replied. Brother Seven then said, I mean, he is not a soul person. There are two. Are you saying there are two of these emperors? Hansen asked with much shock. Brother Seven responded with a nod. There is a male and a female phoenix. Phoenix Emperor is a title given to a pair of spirits. Or maybe they're together, in a two-for-one way? Hansen suggested. Brother Seven agreed and said, It is possible, but they would still wield two separate powers. Brother Seven looked at a lantern to his left and said, This is the fire. It represents Yang. Brother Seven then looked to the right lantern and said, This is the black fire. It represents Yin. Hansen noticed the fires did indeed look different. Do they mean different things? Hansen asked. Brother Seven explained, The living fire is Yang. It guides you to life, survival, and prosperity. The black fire is Yin, which guides you to hell. Brother Seven looked towards the black hallway ahead and said, That is a path that straddles the line between Yin and Yang. I am not sure what danger, if any, will await us. If we seek to survive, we are going to need a lantern. But, but what? Hansen asked. The phoenix lanterns are for the living. We have to bring them, if we want to survive. But even so, that doesn't seem quite right. Brother Seven paused for a brief moment of contemplation, and then went on to say, This is a path between life and death. Then which lantern are we to pick? Hansen asked. I don't know. Whichever we choose, there is great risk. This is a test of this phoenix emperor, and he is smart, whoever he is. Brother Seven had a wry smile. Well, if we aren't going to get any answers, there's no use debating, is there? Let's give it a go. Hansen picked up a lantern without consultation and went on to say, I'll go first and check it out. Hansen didn't know anything about the matters Brother Seven was talking about, so he was not very concerned with the need to be careful. If Phoenix Emperor was ahead and he had to fight him, Hansen was confident he could just use Super King Spirit Mode to defeat him. Hang on. Brother Seven said, as he stopped Han Sr., think of a word in your mind. It can be any word. And now tell me what it is. I can predict, from your word, whether your selection of lantern is good or bad. Hansen smiled and said, prediction is pointless. We can't change our destiny. A decision is a decision. Being able to predict things is a waste of time. I'm going. Good lantern or bad. After that, Hansen lifted his lantern and walked forward into the dark place.